you, thank you, thank you. And I want, to, I want you to, to forgive me for reading my remarks, but, you know, Meryl Streep does it too. Okay, so, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Victoria Macklin, board chair of the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, and it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the Summer Arts Encounter, featuring renowned artist Nick Cave. This event coalesces several important values of Bema Center, supporting artists, creating community around experience of contemporary art, and sustaining the daily operations of one of Omaha's cultural gems. Thanks to all of you for being a part of today and supporting Bema Center. I'd like to thank a number of individuals that are instrumental or have been instrumental in making this event happen. First and foremost, my deepest, deepest gratitude to Nick Cave for allowing us to spotlight you and your inspiring work through this event. Your entire creative output lifts up important social justice issues for us to acknowledge and engage. Thank you. Your partner and collaborator, Bob Faust, played a central role in coordinating your time with us today. And I personally thank you for your trust and generous spirit. I also extend special thanks to the lenders of the four sound suits inside. They include Karen and Robert Duncan, Kathy and Mark LeBaron, Paulina and Bob Schlott, and of course, Betiana and Todd Simon. <laughs> Our other event sponsors also deserve special recognition, including Steve Wake and Rhonda Seacrest, Annette and Paul Smith, Katie Weitz and Tim Wilson, Deanna and Fred Bosselman, Charlie Sullivan and Eric Burden, Joan Gibson and Don Worcester, Amy Haddad and Steve Martin, Denise and Hobson Powell. So we can have an <laughs> Lastly, I offer again my warmest thanks to Bettyana and Todd Simon. <laughs> On a personal note, 20 years ago, I shared lunch with your beloved father, Fred. He spoke of responsible stewardship. The apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. <laughs> I've long admired your family's ubiquitous and consistent support of the arts in our community and beyond. Thank you so much for opening your home and supporting Bemis Center in this very special way. Please join me in offering a round of applause for our gracious host. Todd. Thank you, Vicki. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. I'm also going to read my remarks just like Meryl Streep. Um, <clears throat> Batiana and I are thrilled to be in the company of our visiting artist, Nick Cave, uh, his partner, Bob, uh, and all of you. Uh, Nick, you, we have so admired your work for so long, as you know. Um, it's events like today that demonstrate how the Bema serves a vital uh, role as a cultural asset in our community drawing today's most innovative artists to Omaha so we can all learn from their ideas and artistic practices. I also really want to acknowledge and thank the Bemis Center staff for their hard work and dedication to the organization and for all they did to make Nick's work accessible to the public in its exhibition at Bemis and the live streaming uh, of today's event for our audiences around the world. So a round of applause for the Bemis team, please. 
And without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Nick and Bemis Center's Executive Director, Chris Cook, to begin our program. We look forward to hearing more about Nick's practice and the pieces we are fortunate to have assembled here today. Nick, Chris. Who's broken phone? Exactly. Who wants it now? I like the dancing with you. That was nice. That's yours. That's yours. <laughs> yes. Vicki and Todd, thank you very much uh, for the wonderful remarks. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Thank all of you for being here this afternoon. I'm, ha I'm hope hoping you're having a great time. Uh, so Nick and I are gonna have a little conversation. Uh, I hope you can bear with us. We're gonna open it up to a little Q&A for all of you to lob some hard pressing questions uh, to Nick. And then uh, we will serve dessert. So stick around for that as well. Uh, one last, last housekeeping item, uh, before you leave this afternoon and head home, uh, we have goodie bags for all of you. They're at the check-in table, so please be sure to grab one of those on your way out. It's basically Bemis propaganda. You'll love it. You'll love it. No art? No art, oh. yeah. Just, just swag. Yes, just swag. Which arguably could be, could be art. Uh, I also, um, of course, I'm grateful to be able to s share a stage with you, Nick. I also think that uh, Bob deserves a spe special recognition as well, because he was instrumental in helping us pull this together. So if we could give him another round of applause, that would be appreciated. Stand Thank up, you. Bobby, stand yes, up. Yes, come on, stand Bob. Up. Yeah. Stand up. <laughs> Bashful Bob, okay. But yeah, sincerely, thank you. So I, I want to start, oh, and also I should note, um, I'm sure you've already noticed the slideshow that's been looping while you've been enjoying brunch. It's a collection of images that show uh, early sound suits, uh, recent projects, and a few video clips where you can see the sound suits in action. Um, our conversation is not coordinated with that, so don't try to keep up with this and just pay attention up here if you could. I want to start the conversation around the four sound suits that we were able to assemble today and just to get your feedback on what you think about seeing these earlier pieces assembled together and what are some thoughts that come to mind about seeing these, these old friends uh, assembled. You know, I think when I walked in, uh, I was just traveling back in time. Like, oh, that one was done at that time. This one was done at this time. So it was really interesting to sort of see this, um, just to sort of think back in terms of, of when this work was produced and developed. Um, it was also interesting. Yes, I knew they were here, but it was really great when I first walked in and there was the button one just right there in, in present. And so it just had this amazing feeling to sort of be introduced by this work. Do you... Do I think I've done... I did it? I, I know... <laughs> I don't know. That's a weird question because, <laughs> you know, I remember going to uh, the Brooklyn Museum and I was with some friends, turned the corner, there was a sound suit, and it's just a weird feeling. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's my work, but it's, I don't know. I think that, you know, I, I think my work has never been for me. So I think it's, um, that's that sort of feeling that it's always been for, to be out in the world. And so it's really sort of, uh, it's, it's a very, I don't know, I don't know how I feel. I think I ask if I like it, probably this is the question that I ask myself. Mm -hmm. And so. And, and I know early on um, in making, in developing the sound suits and starting this body of work, uh, you made a point to wear them. 
and to, to physically give them that history. And I'm just wondering, do you recall like wearing these? And if you could talk a little bit about um, how important the movement of the sound suits are and how you integrate dance into that aspect of, of the suits. I know that's a lot, there's a lot there. It's a, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. about five, yeah. five questions there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, you know, uh, I think it's always been important for me to sort of physically be in them for the fact of understanding them, number one. Uh, and so that's just really part of uh, a continuous sort of documentation of the work. Uh, but then these particular ones are not necessarily for performance purposes, and so that changes how they can be made in terms of materials and things of that sort. Um, what was the other? Can you look at your notes? Go back on. <laughs> this question was so big. Uh, well, I'm I'm really curious to know how activating them in a physical oh. way really brings meaning to them that could be considered different than how we're experiencing them today in a frozen in frozen state. Static. You know, I think I think I remember when I would go to the Museum of Natural History. And I would look at all these artifacts that really have been what I consider misplaced and put into this museum setting, forcing us to look at them as objects. You know, I was very interested in that duality that, you know, but when you look at the history of these objects, they sort of all served a purpose within a particular culture. And so, I was interested, I've always been interested in the dual kind of placement of, of an object. And so for me, static offers a different kind of authority, I think, with the work and around the work. Also, it allows me to sort of imagine it being on the body. And so just sort of living with that and imagining that to sort of is interesting to be in that kind of space. Um, and so I think it's really sort of two different uh, ideas, sensations. Uh, I like it as a static object because it's more sculpture as opposed to performative. Uh, and when it's performative, you know, it allows me to be more liberating uh, in my sort of, in, in the act, uh, it hides gender, race, class. And so, you know, it's a lot of work for uh, performers uh, to sort of, you know, surrender, settle, and to become something other. And, and, and so it's not as easy as it seems uh, in that sort of process, uh, but it's wonderful at the same time. So it's, and it's empowering, and it's uh, it demands a lot. Well, and and each sound suit holds a broad spectrum of various materials, whether they're buttons, various fabrics, and I'm curious to know how does each sound suit sound suit get started? Does it start with a specific material or does it start with an idea that you've had that you bring to materials? Is it because you're working on a specific project and you know I've got to crank out these? So how do you get started with each one? I think, you know, the work pretty much gets, you know, it's provoked by material or a particular object. Uh, I don't really draw them I sort of make them in the moment and just through that sort of process, sort of accepting what comes along as they are being sort of developed. Um, and so that keeps it very sort of fresh. It keeps it very, uh, it sort of uh, releases a lot of my responsibility around uh, uh, the spirit of just making and and being free, it's, some, it's important to be free in, that, in the process. 
but you know, it's it's but it's always been provoked by a object or a material. And I know what I, in <clears throat> the articles and interviews that I've read in preparation for today, um, there is uh, there's a lot of focus on how the concept of the sound suit was originated, the context um, that occurred and your experience of that. I'm wondering if you could share that with everyone here today on how was the first sound suit born? You know, the, the first sound suit came out of, of the Rodney King um, incident. Um, and so, and which led to the LA riots. And so, you know, for me, I think I was coming really right out of grad school. As an artist in grad school, I was, a, I was really doing sort of these constructive paintings. So n none of this work was even in my sort of mindset. Um, and so it was really coming, uh, encountering that incident and really for me as a black male struggling with that. Uh, and I happened to be in the park and sitting in the park, there was this twig on the ground and that really was the catalyst for the first sound suit. And so the first sound suit was com made completely out of twigs that I collected in the park. I was building a sculpture I didn't even, it didn't even dawn on me that I could physically put this on until it was completely done. And I was like, oh, I can wear this. And so the moment I put it on and started to move, it made sound. And so that's how sound suit came about. And that sound sort of brought me to this place of protest. In order to be heard, you gotta make noise. And so that was really sort of the sort of moment that my life shifted because when I, I knew when I made the first one I knew that my life would be different for some reason I don't know it just sort of I was like oh shit <laughs> and I really didn't show that work for probably a good eight years I made these sculptures but I would just sort of keep them in the closet because I mentally wasn't quite there yet uh, with what, what's behind the work, what does this mean, um, the demand that it was asking of myself. Uh, and I just needed to get ready and, and be prepared and be sort of mature enough to stand in, in that uh, space. So. I've read that the sound suits are, have been considered these like suits of armor because they protect the wearer, they protect the performer from um, bias and judgments around race, gender, and class, and anything else that we would project onto another human. And, and so there's this internal defense that is there, uh, which is really pointing to some really serious socio-political issues within this country, and at the same time, the exterior is very inviting. And especially when you see them move, they spark uh, emotions and excitement around like joy and mystery and intrigue, and there's this duality where they're able to hold both. They're able to hold um, high, energetic, deep, positive emotion at one point, and also a very um, serious side that uh, points to profound issues that, as a society that we face. And, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the power within that duality itself, within the sound suits. 
Yeah, you know, I think that power in 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 that duality sort of this is, you know, it's me, you know, it's a reflection of myself, and and how do I sort of uh, navigate uh, this uh, world in which we exist in, um, and so in what are my sort of responsibilities within the context of that. Uh, and I have to be able to, you know, I was raised, um, you know, in a wonderful family and, you know, it was all sort of really built around unconditional love and, and so, and self-worth. And so for me, you know, I was, you know, I understood, uh, unfortunately, these sort of, odds that could be against uh, growing up as a, a, a person of color. But at the same time, I was told that, you know, I could be anything I want to be. And so I'm sort of like, oh, shit, here we go. Uh, <laughs> and, but, you know, at this, you know, I think just sort of, for me, it's really sort of uh, understanding the sort of space, the arena, in which I'm working in, um, and you know, navigating that. You know, I I have to know how to navigate circumstances that may be very difficult, that I may find myself in, and really sort of take the high road. Um, but as a person, I am collectively. Uh, whole. Uh, I know what it is that I want. Uh, I know the kind of person I am today as well as going forward. And uh, I know that my work has always been based around service and uh, working toward what I'm leaving behind. And so, you know, I'm an artist with a civic responsibility at the end of the day. And so that is what's important to me. And so whatever I may be up against, I'm still pushing for equality and just uh, inclusion. Has that, has the urgency around um, service, how has that been amplified um, over the last year and the murder of George Floyd the social unrest that immediately followed and the racial justice movement that is sweeping this country and many others? And has your approach to art making changed in response to that? Um, and if so, if you, if you could share. You know, I think, you know, I think about like the projects that I'm working on currently and I think about the organizations that I'm working with, and I think about, I mean, because there's a lot of unraveling uh, happening, <laughs> trust me, everywhere. And so I think about, like, within the context of that, I think for me as an artist, there is a place in which I can sort of help facilitate uh, and move uh, us forward. And so I'm more interested in you know, those sort of strategies and, and ways of, of sort of changing the sort of um, way in which things look, uh, ways in which organizations are, you know, they're doing work, but how do you sort of bring that to the forefront, you know? Uh, and so it's very, very important to me that, uh, that I sort of am also participating in this moment. You know, post George Floyd, I am thinking very differently about my work. You know, uh, prior George Floyd, you know, my work has always been sort of um, triggered by trauma. And so now it's completely like I've sort of moved 
it to the back. And so trauma will only enter my work when it happens in that moment. And so, which is allowing me to like, whoa, I could, now I can sort of, you know, think about painting and what, what am I interested in painting outside of it being about something political. And that when something happens, how does that get introduced into the, mo the work in the moment? And so it's a different kind of, uh, you know, it has liberated me a bit. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm interested in moving, you know, I've been always interested in material, but right now it's really bronze, just sort of moving into, again, work that can be more accessible, uh, because, again, there's still a large population that still feels not uh, necessarily sort of welcomed by institutions and things of that sort, so I'm always interested in you know, how can I get the work out into the world the way in which I want to be? Um, so I'm excited. I'm interested in just uh, that. I'm interested in well the wellness of my existence and really being as proactive as I possibly can be um, through my work, through facility, which is the building in which we own and using that as a, another platform. So, so two things. Um, earlier on you spoke about working in bronze and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the bronze works that you're doing and how um, you hope they'll function within public space. And then my next question is going to be about facility, which is a live workspace <coughs> that Nick and Bob uh, just settled in um, in the northwest side of Chicago. And uh, not to bring it back to Bemis, but I did like this, you know, this corollary to, you know, artists developing a live workspace for themselves and at the same time having a storefront, opening a door and letting that space turn into uh, a platform for other artists to share their work, uh, whether it's through painting, sculpture, or performance. Um, so, but going back to the bronze pieces, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about them and how you hope they function out in the world. Well, you know, I've been trying to sort of get there. I've been thinking about it for like five years. Like a sound suit in bronze, why not? Um, and, uh, you know, so I've been doing work that has led me up to just uh, to one day I just said, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to go all in. And so the first uh, bronze uh, sound suit, it's about 10 feet. Uh, it's a seated figure, uh, an addition of 10 with two APs. You know, I was just sort of, I did it to sort of see if it was, you know, how it would sort of be received and, and uh, extremely well. So the next uh, bronze sound suit will be a standing figure that's 16 feet. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, I, th I think it was also, I was getting there, but also it was sort of what was happening at the same time was the sort of dismantling of all the uh, political uh, uh, sculpture that, uh, that's that been sort of out in the world. Um, and so it was really sort of an interesting moment where, you know, this sort of uh, dismantling as well as sort of this rebirth uh, happening. And so, you know, I'm reimagining what what does a what does that look like today? Um, so, so a, re a retelling of histories, so to speak, 
through new forms of monuments um, that this, these bronze could um, be commissioned for those types of public spaces uh, mm -hmm. to provide an alternative understanding to how we think about the history of this country, community, et cetera. Is, is, is that the, the approach you're taking with these? I mean, it is and it isn't. Uh, now, if I was asked to do a commission and that was, I don't think I'm thinking literally in that sort of sense, but if we want to talk about that. So a commission we, that Bemis yeah, could offer I mean, up? Yeah. Right. Are, are there any sponsors is that, is that what we're for talking about? a commission in front of uh, Bemis? We could talk after, okay? Yeah. Okay, so switching gears a little bit and going back to this amazing space that you and Bob just move into, a Herculean effort is my understanding. And I'm, I mean, I understand the practical aspects of uh, moving studios together, creating a shared live workspace. Um, but I'm also wondering about uh, your interest in engaging community in that way, even if it's in a really small effort. I understand you don't want to turn it into a nonprofit and have you know a director and a staff, but at the same time, you are opening your door to, to artists to allow them to express themselves in, in your community. So I'm, I'm curious to know how like, that plays into and off of all the other work that you're doing, and Bob, you too. I, I mean, because you are obviously an integral role in this and uh, have a lot of other things to, to focus on. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think we were looking for a space like for six, seven years. Um, and it really came down to like the zoning. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we almost closed on a, bill, on a property but the, the zoning couldn't be changed to live work, and so we would just have to like drop uh, the project. And so I don't know why I was up on the northwest side of the city, but I was. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be driving, and I saw this building. Bob was out of town, and I'm like, I found the building. <laughs> He's like, right. Um, <laughs> And so then I called and was able to sort of, uh, sort of, uh, go inside and 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 look at the sp the space, and it was really sort of, it was completely wide open. When I from the front, it looks like three storefronts, but when I went in, it was completely wide open, twenty four thousand square feet, um, and. It just sort of made sense in terms of how it would function. Uh, you know, you know, you become an artist. You have a studio. Uh, you need more space. You get another space on, in in another part of a building. Then you need more space, and you're on another floor. And then you're like, oh, this project we can't make on the third floor. We got to make it on the ground floor because we can't get it out of the building. And so just looking for space that can just sort of have everything on the ground floor, it can sort of move from, from the studio into the receiving room, it just all needed to make sense. And so really sort of finding space that could do that, live space that could um, support the collection because we are collectors as well. Um, and I was very interested in a storefront, being able to create space that we could host projects that uh, you can view from outside and we didn't have to open up our doors uh, was really important. Uh, and to be able to, and to understand the, uh, the use of the building. I think when George Floyd happened, I was in Missouri visiting my mom, and I was like, Mom, I've got to get home. I just, I was so stressed out and overwhelmed, and I just felt like I needed to do something in that moment, and thank God for facility, because we were able to create a project 
on the front of the windows in the, of the building, which was like life changing. So when you have, so you understand like the function and, and, and how, how do we use this space? Why do we have it? Why do we need this much space? How do we want to use it? What's well, really, really important uh, for us. And so, you know, it, it, it creates opportunity for young artists or established artists to come and do special projects. Um, you know, my grad students, uh, during COVID, we had to shut down. I am a professor at the School of the Art Institute. We had to shut down three quarters of the way through the end of the year. So they were going into their thesis. So they had no thesis projects. There was no exhibition. So we at Facility was able to host this series of, of solo projects for each one of them. So that was like, again, another one of those moments that was like amazing that we could do that. And so it's really magnificent, this space and you know, we love working there. We, uh, it's surrounded by art. You know, we wake up to our destiny. So it's everything we can imagine. It sounds really special. I'm sure all of us will, will uh, be looking up the address and be at your doorstep very soon. Yeah, for, for a tour. Do That's not. Right. <laughs> Do not. <laughs> so, uh, well, maybe. <laughs> Last topic I wanted to focus on just briefly um, is I imagine that, I mean, when you get home, things will start really uh, kicking into gear if they're not already within the studio uh, because you have a major retrospective opening up at the MCA in Chicago next May. And I'm, I, I mean, I know you've lived in Chicago a long time and as a visual artist, I'm wondering what does it mean for you to be uh, offered this opportunity and to have a uh, you know a home uh, institution celebrating you and your work uh, with this level of limelight. I mean, I'm just curious to know how you respond to that. Yeah. How do I respond to that? You know, I, I am grateful of course, and, and very pleased, but you know, I, I'm sort of more, I know what the demands are, and so what is expected of me. So I think that's where my sort of focus is, is that I better fucking bring it. Uh, and so, <laughs> Agreed, and so, agreed. <laughs> and so, you know, that's just a level of, of you know, that's just, a, you know, that is uh, something that I think about. It doesn't sort of put me under pressure because I have my own sort of level of expectations. And, uh, but I think what's more interesting for me is just this sort of collaboration that we're doing. You know, there's a lot going on with the MCA in terms of, of post-George Floyd. And so, again, we're thinking about like, well, how can we help sort of bring this institution forward. Um, and so we're collabor collaborating with DuSable Museum uh, on a, I'm, I'm doing a sort of collaboration with my brother Jack, who's also a professor at the Art Institute um, in Chicago. Uh, and so we're doing a fashion performance in response to my exhibition, uh, which will take place at DuSable Museum. And so again, sort of bridging these two institutions together. Also, we'll be working with over about 200 individuals local in the city to build this performance. Um, and so uh, that's interesting to me. That's what's happening in the studio right now. Uh, you know, my assistants, I pretty much work with probably eight to 10 full-time assistance at, at any given moment, but we're doubling that when I get back because there's, you know, there's parts of the projects that will take eight months to build one thing. And so just really sort of looking at the schedule and, and uh, looking at the space and how do we sort of 
allocate space for everyone to be able to work in the space during COVID and, and uh, just staying on top of things. Uh, Bob's producing the book for the exhibition, also has a very sort of critical part in creating a number of wall works for the, the exhibition. So we work very sort of close together uh, and, and uh, it's great, it's fun. Well, congratulations to both of you on this amazing exhibition. And all of your new founded Omaha friends will be there at the opening in May. Yeah. Um, so I think now, if it's okay with you if, uh, to transition <coughs> and uh, pass around a microphone for questions from the audience. Rachel has the microphone in the back if anyone has uh, a question okay. for Nick. Anyone have a question? Robert up front does. I'm coming. Oh. One back here and then you, Robert, okay. okay? Hi, my name is Elaji, and first of all, I'm so honored to be here. Girl, so you in that pink dress, I need to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> So sweet. Um, so I guess my question is, I feel like your pieces kind of just really tap into like a childlike energy for me. And so I'm just wondering, are there like any distinct moments of your childhood that like inspire any of your pieces or? You know, I think what it was is probably just, you know, my parents just sort of uh, recognizing that I was, I was a maker. Like I would like make my mother clothes and like clogs and things and yeah, I don't know. Uh, but I think it was just, you know, just sort of recognizing that and sort of uh, seeing that and giving me sort of permission to sort of explore that and um, which was everything. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm coming. I can run in these, I swear. Yeah, Nick, Robert, hey, Duncan. Robert. Um, Karen wants to know, <laughs> or, how did you... Oh, my God, Karen, he called you out. Yeah. <laughs> where did you get those great arms? <coughs> That's from lifting those sound suits. Oh, my God. <laughs> when, I, when I went to the gym, those were called your guns. <laughs> they still are. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, you know, I have my my daily routine, which is like up at 5.30. You know, I have to sort of like have time for myself. So workout is part of that. And, um, you know, just sort of uh, preparing and just getting myself ready for, for the day. Uh, health has always been important to me. Um, Bob just got his yoga certificate <laughs> during COVID, which is great. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. Our international audience that this is being <laughs> streamed to. One other request. Uh, after dessert, could we get the four collectors with uh, Nick and Bob for a photograph inside with the pieces? Sure. Okay, let's do that. Anyone else have a question? Oh, Todd. Hi, guys. Um, so you said something about um, seeing uh, objects in the Museum of Natural History that seemed <clears throat> you know, out of place and sort of misplaced. And I'm curious as to you know, 50 or 100 years from now, when uh, an observer like you sees one of your objects in a museum, are you hoping that that will elicit a different response and I guess I'm not going to get into the whole institutional, uh, you know, access thing, but I'm just, I'm curious as to, you, it seems like you're creating a new cultural language, if you will, based on the moment. And why is that that much different than those objects that you're seeing misplaced? Well, I think the objects that are misplaced are, don't belong to us. I think that's number one. Uh, and I think that, you know, I'm American, I'm Western, so I think that, you know, I make art, those are not, I don't think I see those as art. 
as, as opposed to artifacts. Art. 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 Hopefully, they can read our wall labels at that point. Uh, right. Oh, Susan. Hi, Suzanne Wise from the Nebraska Arts Council. Hey, Suzanne. Hi, and I was curious about the transition into bronze because your work is so tactile <coughs> in using so many, I mean, bronze is yet a different type of material, but it seems so solid <laughs> in comparison to a lot of your other work. Have you found it to be a challenge to make that transition? Uh, no, actually. Um, because I really sort of thought about it a lot. And, you know, I think a lot of my work, there's a lot of pattern, there's a lot of visceral sort of texture. And so with all of my work, work I've always, you know, thought a lot about, like, what is it that I'm transferring? So at the end of the day, it really comes down to the essence. It doesn't matter what the material is. It's like, how do I transfer that over? And so... I mean, when I saw the bronze for the first time, it was exceeded beyond my expectations altogether. I mean, it's visceral, it's texture, it's pattern, it's uh, epic, uh, and it really, uh, it really works. And so for me, it's really sort of looking at uh, materials that can help sort of facilitate these sort of actions, you know. So you would be surprised what I'm working with to get a lot of the pattern, but it's really sort of things that I've collected at the antique malls and, and thrift stores that, again, sort of have that uh, content in it. And so it's really just building in a different way. It's heavy, but it's like Bob has something to say, I think. Oh, you have a question. It's not a question. I just add to that. Do you want to take mine? You can hear me, right? Yeah. Give him the mic. <laughs> no, one of the things that we also found with the bronze, once it was all done, in when you're in front of it, it's much ones, right? It's also blackened, and blackened to um, a matte black, which is also super surprising, right? Because you're used to all this color. But what happens when you get next to it, because you're kind of drawn to it, because it's this big presence, like a tree is a big presence, it starts to absorb your energy. And these ones in here seem to, and this one absorbs it. So I think it's more like a collector, you know, and it kind of creates uh, the community's energy, right? And so it becomes a shared thing. And so that color is there. It's just all inside of it. And that sounds a little, you know, arty. Um, but it actually, it, that actually is what you feel. Thanks, Bob. Vicki, you had a question, right? This is a ridiculously mundane question. First of all, how long does it take you to create a sound suit? Let's say, let's take the first one and you walk in the door, the button one. Yes. Uh, so I would have four people working on it in the studio. And probably three, I would say three weeks. No overtime. I don't believe in none of that. <laughs> Just, That's I can't. I can't. It, I can't be stressed out and like overwhelmed. So, about three weeks. Okay. So this next question is: I was looking at the sound suits carefully, 
and trying to figure out how does the wearer see out? <laughs> because it doesn't look like us. It's well, in those see. particular ones, you they wouldn't be for performance. Okay. But when they are, you know, that's all built into the design. Yes. Yeah, but you know, we could be completely fully uh, covered, but you know, it's design where you know where your eyes are. We will sort of construct it very differently. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Robert. Um, hello, I'm Bob O'Meal here from New York. When we had a chance to chat in the house, I was asking you about some of the antecedents to the sound suits. And you mentioned the New Orleans Mardi Gras, uh, Indian suits and things like that. Can you extend that and can you draw a line for us from that kind of ritual activity and processional dance and what you do? Well, you know, I think with the sounds, it's, I think, you know, it's really sort of this blend of sort of uh, a number of sort of cultures from all over, you know, the Gigungun. Uh, you know, I could be looking at the Haitian voodoo flags. Uh, so it's really sort of uh, me sort of through research, through travel, just sort of looking at uh, just aspects of adornment and, and how that becomes uh, the sort of visual language that is applied to the work. But then, you know, I'm very interested in uh, movement, dance, and, and uh, may it be sort of, uh, I think all of the performance work, there is this sort of element of ritual that's built into into that practice, uh, for the most part, it's you know, I most you know I work in a way where I bring, let's say, thirty sound suits to a city, and then I hire the city to build the project. So I never bring dancers. I never, I only bring my choreographer, and that's pretty much it. And then we just hire musicians, vocalists dancers and we go into a residency and we build a project in that sort of moment. So, you know, the real work and the most interesting work is really the behind the scenes. You know, the building of a project which is like life changing for me. Uh, and working with these artists that perhaps may, you know, in attendance may have 500 people at a, at a work of their own to like 8,000. So for me, I'm interested in sort of like, you know, well, what does it feel like to be, to create this kind of platform for, for artists uh, to, re, to imagine what is possible? So the performance is partially in the making of the film. Totally. I think we have time for one more question. One more. Oh, sorry, okay. Karen. Okay, two more. <laughs> okay, when you were talking about the button suit, you talked about um, having three or four people helping yes, you to assemble. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you have them do in comparison to what you do? Is yours, are you the big idea, and then everybody kind of helps you get to that point of the final piece? Or how does that work? Yes, I am the big idea, but... <laughs> so they pretty much... Um, they sort of do more or less just the surface work. Like, I sort of orchestrate where things go. I lay out everything. Uh, I sort of do the sort of finish to everything. Uh, it has to sort of always have a certain sort of level of, of, of uh, sort of look to it that I sort of know. 
And so they think I'm sort of crazy in the studio because I'm like, oh, you know, put, you know, this is here, this is going with that and that. So let's just, you know, stitch this all down. And they're like, none of this makes sense. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's, again, you know, I really sort of, I just sort of have come to a place in my practice where it's okay if it doesn't make sense. It, you know, somewhere along the way, it will all come together. And so I know how to make that happen. How many sound suits? Uh, I don't have any clue. Four to five hundred. Four to five hundred. Four to five hundred. <laughs> Four to five hundred, Bob. I know. I, can I ask also? I have a quick question. Um, I think some of us here maybe saw some of the herd performances mm -hmm. with the horses. And I wanted to maybe, if you could talk about the, the difference between the, the sound suits as individual people and the sound suits as horses. Well, again, I think, you know, I'm always interested in sort of, uh, you know, how can I make work that can reach a broader audience, meaning, you know, sometimes it's like, how do I reach kids and their parents, kids, parents, and adults? And so, and then I'm also thinking about just, you know, with herd, it was really sort of, you know, getting us back to this place of dreaming. You know, I remember when, a, when I was a kid, my mother put that sock on her hand and it was a puppet and I was there. I was just completely there. And so it really sort of came out of that. You know, each horse had a different pattern on its uh, head, which was each pattern, pattern was referenced a different sort of culture. So again, I'm sort of thinking and talking about unity and, and sort of inclusion in, in, in this sort of capacity. Uh, you know, we did herd for the first time in New York at Grand Central Station for two weeks. Uh, there was no backstage prep space, so we had to think about, okay, all of that has to be done in front of the public. So these are last minute decisions where I'm like, <laughs> what are we going to do? And so that became part of this whole process, the, the process of getting dressed. And, and, but it was so amazing because you didn't even remember when that transition happened. And so it's these sort of moments that sort of, again, sort of change and, and forces me to think about these alternative ways of working and thinking about my work. Uh, and that anything is possible and it, you, know, you just have to give yourself sort of time to sort of reimagine. It's all about reimagining. Nick, thank you very yes. much for sharing your time with us this weekend and today sharing your work with us, of course, and, and also allowing us to dream alongside you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think dessert is served if anybody wants dessert, so. <laughs>